Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Tyler Jagan. I'm the lead pastor here at River Run, and, and I'm so glad that you guys are joining us this morning. We've been in this series now for a few weeks about Jesus, but it's a little bit different in the way that we're kind of approaching it. It's not so much of about Jesus, you know, who he was and things like that. Now, obviously, those things are absolutely important. But what we're really looking at is how did Jesus interact with certain groups of people? And what do should, if you find yourselves within that kind of group, what should you know about Jesus? And so today, uh, I'm just going to jump right in. Today, we're just looking at what the poor should know about Jesus. And so my message today is really, I'm going to focus on those of you who struggle financially. I'm going to talk to those of you who are poor. Now, you may say, well, wait a minute. The, you know, I'm not really poor. I'm doing okay. And so I guess this message isn't really about me. So I'm just going to, you know, turn off the light and take a nap. And my encouragement, my hope is that you wouldn't do that. Often too, uh, too many times I find in, in our Christian world is when we hear a message that it's not like directed exactly to us, we tend to turn it off and we don't learn from that. And what happens is the unintended consequences of that is, is that we become ineffective in helping other people that we come across who are dealing with those issues. And so this would be a great opportunity that if you don't find yourselves in that grouping to be able to just to kind of sit back and say, okay, so how does God really think about those who are poor? And what should I think about when I think about those who have less than I do? And how should I, when I come in contact and, and build relationships with people who have less than I am, how should I approach that relationship? So that's my hope as we really kind of dive in and kind of focus in for those of you who are poor. Um, and so right off the bat, uh, God has a lot to say with that, okay? Uh, talk about, you know, finances and resources and, and generosity. There's over 2,000 verses in the Bible that talks about being generous. So there's lots of scripture for, there, for you guys who have resources to, re to read those to see what God's heart is about us being generous. We talk about here at River Run, one of our culture statements is uh, generosity changes lives. And it's because of God's generosity that our lives are changed. And so we reflect as God is molding us to be people who reflect his goodness, that we would be people that he would use to be generous in our hearts and our love towards others by which God would use that to change their lives. There's no doubt about that. So, but I want us to talk about, you know, the issue of poverty and speak to those of you who are specifically dealing with poverty. Because another one of our culture statements is this, it's this. It is that moving closer to God moves you closer to people. That you cannot move closer to God and move away or keep people away. It will stunt your, your relationship with God. It's God's desire for all of us to build relationships with other people, with people who are different from us. And when we talk about, you know, moving closer to other people, we talk about moving closer to people that specifically that we have some kind of awkwardness, some kind of, you know, uh, issues with, or really don't know how to kind of have a relationship with them. Because I believe it's our, God's de design and his desire to, to break those, those, um, those areas of messiness and all of our disconnected relationships in order to become one people. In fact, Scripture talks about us being one. He's neither male nor female, Jew or Gentile, a slave or free, barbarian or civilized, et cetera, et cetera. And so we want to be a people that really steps into those, those areas of those relationships that, that we may be stuck in. There may be areas where we may be stuck ra uh, racially, uh, culturally, there may be areas in our relationships where we feel a sense of awkwardness or a disconnect with people with special needs. And one of those areas I think where we struggle with as a culture as well is building bridges and building relationships with people within different economic backgrounds. And, and so I want to just kind of speak to that. But more importantly, I want to speak to those of you who are uh, financially poor because you have been taught and learned a lot of rubbish, a lot of lies. You are taught that if you have less, your life is, 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 um, is, is less. If you have more, then your life is worth more. Um, if you have more, then you are more valued. And if you have less, then your life has less value. These are the things that do not come from the, from the God who made everything. This comes from toxic fallen humanity. And because of that, it's created so much just um, uh, strife uh, externally in relationships, but also internally in how we view ourselves. Because if you are poor, one of the first things you have to know and you really need to realize from, not just from me, but what from God says all throughout history, uh, given to us through scripture is this, you are not what you have and you are not what you don't have. 
It's not who you are. That's a, that's a false misunderstanding of value and the value of humanity based on what you have. It is something that we tend to do, and, and sometimes we feel it. If you have been around um, people who have a lot more, sometimes it can feel very intimidating. And, and, and when people around you who have a lot more, it's easy to think that their life must be more valuable. Um, if, you, um, you know, if you've been struggling financially and you look at your life, you don't have any money, then your life must not be a success. You must be a failure. That is from the pit of hell. That comes from hell. It doesn't come from heaven. It doesn't come from God. How do I know? Because Jesus himself said this in Luke 12, 15. He said this. He said this about finances and our money. He said, Jesus said, life is not measured by what you own. Your self-worth has nothing to do with your net worth. It has nothing whatsoever to do with that. If you believe that, then that's not from God. That's from other people. That's from other things. It's something that you bought into, like I said, is not true. You know why I know it's not true? Because look at Jesus Christ. Jesus is the most worship honored, talked about human being who's ever lived. Nobody would say that Jesus is a failure. Guess how much money Jesus had when he was on this planet? He didn't have anything. Okay. And when we think about, you know, degrees and all of that, you know, what did Jesus have a PhD? Did he have a master's degree? He didn't have any of those degrees. And so really it's kind of, when we think about it, we worship and honor more than any other person in human history, a person who had no money and had no degrees. Okay. And none of us would say, well, Jesus, well, you know, since he really didn't have a whole lot of money, then he must not have been, more, you know, his life must have been a failure. Nobody would say that. Nobody would say that. And so Jesus knows. Jesus knows that, hey, life is not measured out by what you own. Life is really about not so much of what you have, but whose you are. Life is found, the value of life is found, as Nate was saying, in our relationship with the most high God, with our father who allows us and desires for us to be in his presence, that he is the one who gives us worth. And it's so important to think that. And I understand that. I know there, there's so much in this culture all around media and everything that keeps speaking all of these things to us. But let me just encourage you, who is better to listen to? The one who created the world, who's consistent in his love, consistent in his character, consistent in his mission and purpose and, and reasons for everything? Or you're going to put all uh, or listen to, you know, people who are broken, who are, can be selfish, who can be insecure, who can be all over the map. They can be one thing one day and the next thing the next day. Who are you going to listen to? Which one is really the most healthy person to, to, to listen to when it comes to the value of your life? It's God. Obviously, it's God. And so we see from Jesus Christ that your life is not measured by what you own. It has absolutely nothing to do with how much money you have in your pocket, what kind of car you drive, or what your house you live in. Jesus broke that, broke that, that, that um, misnomer and that misunderstanding about life. In fact, when Jesus came, Jesus came to do something that no one has ever done in human history, which is why we honor him. He came to bring dignity and respect to those who are outside, and particularly uh, to bring dignity and respect to those who don't have any money, the impoverished. In fact, you, you are highly valued by Jesus Christ. You're highly valued by Jesus Christ, and you're not just highly valued by Jesus Christ, and you're not highly valued by Jesus Christ at all by how much money you have. Jesus doesn't go and say, you know what, since you have money, then I need you. And since you don't have any money, then I can't use you. We don't see that at all. What we see with Jesus is Jesus says, hey, all of you are valuable. And it has absolutely nothing to do with how much money you have. You are valuable because you were created by God and he loves you. In fact, we see this in Jesus's life and his ministry. In the Gospel of Luke, which is just Luke's writing of Jesus' life, 
He writes this scene, and this scene that we're going to look at here in Luke chapter 4 is really the, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. If you ever wondered, did Jesus have a mission statement? This is probably the closest thing to, to a mission statement because what you will see here is Jesus talk about right off the get-go when he starts his ministry here in, in Luke, what his ministry, and what his purpose is all about. So if you're Bible, you can look over to Luke chapter four. You can just follow us here on the screen, but Luke chapter four, verse uh, 16 and 17. So when he, Jesus, came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written um, in the uh, prophecies of Isaiah. He goes on, verse 18, and this is what he, what he spoke. So Jesus gets up, he unrolls it, he comes to this point, and this is what he says to the people who were there in that synagogue 2,000 years ago. He, he's, he reads these words from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. So he reads this, and everybody in the synagogue would sit there and go, yeah, 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 that's, that's, that's the prophet Isaiah, all right. And that's, yeah, that's pretty much sums what the prophet Isaiah said about the one who would, who would come one day, and, and that person who would come one day, to, and he would do these things, he would bring good news to the poor, to the poor who have been living their lives in this, this constant state of bad news that their life is worthless, their life doesn't really matter, their, wife, their life doesn't have value as it does, all of the, the rulers, the people of position, the people of money, that this person would come and set all that straight, that he would come and he would proclaim that those who are captive would be released, that the blind will see and the oppressed would be set free. And at the Lord of the time's favor, man, we are looking forward to that day. They would have been listening to that and they would probably be thinking somewhere along those thoughts. But then Jesus does something totally different, uh, which makes him totally different of who he is. And he goes and he does this, going here in verse 20. So he reads all of that. And so he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant. And then Jesus sat down. And then all, in the eye, all the eyes of the synagogue looked at him intently. All right, so what is this guy going to say about what, what Isaiah said? And then he began to speak to them. And then scandalously he says, the scriptures you've just heard has been fulfilled this day. I'm the one. I'm the one who's come to bring and speak good news to the poor. And we see all throughout Jesus' ministry, the thing that he speaks over and over and over and over to people who are under resource is this. The, li the world has been speaking lies to you. Your life has value. Your life has value. I have come to give my life to you because your life has value. To bring you into, you know, God's family as a son and daughter of the Most High King to make you royalty. I've come because you have value. I've come because you have dignity because God has made you in his image to reflect his image and to enjoy for all eternity an intimate relationship with the most high king. So we see right at the beginning of Jesus's ministry, he has come to speak to the poor. Yeah, he's come to speak to those who are spiritually impoverished. Yeah, he's come to speak to those who are, you know, uh, emotionally impoverished. And yes, he has come to speak to those who are uh, financially impoverished. To tell the world that the wealth that we, that we can experience that gives us joy and purpose and meaning in life is not based on the things of this world, but it's based on a relationship with a God who loves you. You are valuable. If you think otherwise, then you're thinking a lie. If other people tell you otherwise, they're telling you a lie. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself, God in the flesh, has spoken, and he has spoken that you are valuable. You have immense value. 
Jesus Christ would not have come into this world and gave up his life and done what he did if he did not think you were valuable. You are valuable. The other thing that you need to, to recognize that even though you may not have much money in your pocket and you may, most other people may have a lot more money than you, you need to know this one thing, which is absolutely crucial. You are just like everyone else. You're just like everyone else. You are not different. Your difference is not based on how much money you have or the lack of money that you have. You need to understand that you're just like all every 7 billion people. If you are poor, you are just like the rich man. And how are you just like the rich man? We're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have messed up. All of us have insecurities. All of us fear what may happen in the future. All of us have dealt with broken relationships. All of us feel weird and awkward around people who are different from us. We're all the same. If you are poor, you're just like everybody else. In fact, we also have a saying here around here at River Run that God takes strangers and makes them family. And we do this thing called rooted. And what Rooted is, is basically 10 weeks where you gather together with people you, have, you don't even really know until you started this thing. And they're all different backgrounds and they all just have two things in common. One is every single person just wants to know Jesus Christ and wants to grow in the relationship with God. And as two, every single person just has ears in their lives that they want to grow. A few years back, I had a friend of mine who was going through Rooted and, and he comes from um, a life of poverty and has dealt with it his whole life. And, and he had struggled with all the lies that, that have been told about him and all the things that the world has told about him, that his life doesn't have much value to it. And he felt very intimidated and very, um, in a lot of ways, insecure around being people who have more money than him or have a better job title than him. And I told him, I said, here's the deal. When you go through Rooted, what you're going to find is, yeah, you're going to have people who are going to be different from you. You're going to go through that. But here's what you're going to find out. You're going to find out that wealthy people are just as messy. You know, just as messy. Their messiness may not look financially, either, but their messiness looks in different ways because all of us, all of humanity is broken and fallen and needs Jesus Christ. We're all the same. And you're going to go through this and you're going to find out that, that there's a lot of people that you thought because of their wealth or because of their, you know, um, because of their background that they never have any kind of insecurities or any kind of fears or any anxiety or stress or anything like that. You're going to be surprised by that. And sure enough, going through that, that, that uh, going through Rooted, he recognized that, wow, we really are all the same. And what would it be like if, if all of us would just kind of get rid of all the outward differences and we all came together where we are all the same? Broken people needing a savior, being found by a savior who has saved us and who gives us peace and joy based on the relationship that we have with him and with each other. That life is really truly about a reconciled relationship with God and with one another regardless of all the other stuff on the outside, it can just be so much noise. When we find that, we find a sense of unity that is strong and beautiful and amazing. And, and we have these relationships now that flow in and out, irregardless of somebody's background. I always realize that I need some reconciliation in my life when I find that I have a hard time uh, freely having a relationship with somebody who's different from me. Let me ask you a question, you know, if you, have you ever been around somebody who has had a title or has a lot more money than you or a position more money than you and you felt a sense of insecurity or a sense of stress or anxiety, you know, being around that person almost feels intimidating. I bet a lot of us have, have been somewhere in that before, right? Or we've acted differently around them because of their position and whatnot. Flip side of that, have you ever been around somebody who is really poor, a lot, you know, in a different economic place than you are, and, you, you know, and um, stepping into their world, you feel weird or you feel awkward and, and all of that? Probably all of us have, if we really kind of dig deep into some of the relationships that we have. But here's the deal. Jesus Christ came to this world to eradicate that so we can freely have relationships together 
unified, without the weirdness and the awkwardness of all the things that come from all the stuff about how we value the things of this world and value outside stuff. What if we just eradicated all that and we just saw each other the way that God sees one another and sees each other? It would be amazing. It would be revolutionizing. It would change our world. If you are poor in this church or people have inadvertently, because I believe I'd love everybody in this church and I, I think they really desire to know God. But if anybody here has inadvertently made you feel less than, than who you are in Jesus Christ, I just want to apologize to you because that's not our goal. It's not our vision. Our vision is for us to be all different kinds of people in this room by which we can have relationships with each other and enjoy each other. And as we work through the funk of all the weird and awkwardness of all of our differences and, and, and find our way towards our unity in Jesus Christ, that's our goal. It's our heart. And, you know, Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 7, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for them, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Or another language, a translation puts it this way, you know, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What Jesus is basically saying is this, is that, you know what, you are blessed when you realize you need Jesus, okay? And you are blessed when you realize you need a Savior, and what Jesus is also kind of talking about here is, guess what? We all need Christ, every single one of us. Jesus isn't just for this person, but not for that. No, 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 we're all broken. We're all spiritually impoverished. We all need Jesus Christ. We're all the same. And if you are poor, you deal with financial resources and you deal with, you deal the struggles with that and you deal with feelings and sense of that shame or anything like that, I want to continue to reassure you if you believe that because you, your life isn't valuable because of how much money you have or lack thereof, it's a lie because I want you to know and I want you to realize that in Jesus Christ, you are, just like Nate was saying earlier, you are royalty. You're royalty. Royalty in the kingdom of God has absolutely nothing to do with how much money mummy has, right? Has nothing to do with whether, you know, with Buckingham Palace and, and jet setting around the world and having caviar and champagne and doing all of that. And, and royalty in the kingdom of God is really about value in your position with the king of kings. It means, as Nate was kind of talking about earlier, is that if you are a child of God, you are a son and daughter of the king. If you are the son and the daughter of the king, that makes you a prince and a princess. You are royalty by your position in Christ. It is who you are. It has nothing to do with how much money you have because again, we go back to Jesus. Jesus is called the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. How can he be the King of Kings if he has no money? Well, because the kingdom does that, has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with relationships and influence and, and those things. It's about our relationship with God. You are royalty. See, Peter said it like this. Remember, Peter was a fisherman. Not really a guy who had a lot of money in his day. But, and so he, you know, Followed Jesus Christ, was saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, just like you and I uh, are. And, and then, you know, you see from him talk about how he used to be a fisherman. He's now royalty. And he says this, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. Now, here's the deal. This is why God is so different and why he's so awesome. God chose you not because of your skill set or chose you because how much money you had in your pocket. All right? He didn't. He chose you because he loves you. He loves you deeply. He chose you because he wants to have an intimate relationship with you forever. He chose you. You are his chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And then as a result of that, knowing that your, your self-worth is not based on your net worth, you're highly valued by God, you are saved just like every single other person uh, who needs salvation and, and has been given salvation around the world. 
that you are royalty. And in, this, I, and in this understanding of your royalty, you now have the opportunity to go and show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. It's another, it is another fallacy. The fallacy of, you know what? You need to go to seminary. You need to be well-educated. You need to be highly influential. You need to have a position in order to have an influence in the lives of other people. It's a lie. It's a lie. We see that all throughout scripture. There's only one thing that we all need. And that is to basically to say to God, yes, sir. Yes, sir. God, you have changed my life as you brought me into a relationship with you that I've experienced the forgiveness of my sins, the movement into a new family by which my dad, my heavenly father is the king of kings that makes me this, you know, a son of God, makes me a prince, a royalty by which I am loved and valued because of my relationship with him, not because of anything else in this world. I can now step into other people's darkness and rescue them out of the same pit of hell that I once was in. It's not about influence. It's not about, you know, how much money we have. It's just simply about, God, you changed my life. And I want to tell my friends and my family this goodness that God has given me. The kingdom of God, I mean, think about it. Again, let's look back at Jesus. Jesus. Jesus didn't go, he, in his mind, he didn't go, you know what, I really need to convince Pontius Pilate. He's the most powerful person in this region. If, and if I can convince him, then everybody will follow me. Jesus didn't go, you know what, if I just go to Rome, if I just go to Rome, and, and if I can convince the emperor, then everything's going to change. No, 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 no. The kingdom of God has always been influenced one person at a time of just simply loving a friend, simply loving a neighbor, giving a friend, giving a neighbor, giving a coworker what we have been given in Christ Jesus. Love, forgiveness, dignity, hope, relationships, reconciliation, all of these beautiful things. All of us in this room can give to somebody that we love if we allow God to continue to love us and to, and to remind us of who we are in Christ and just to give that away. And if you are poor, I think it's important for you to understand, you have a gift to the church. You have a gift to give to the church. And you say, wait a minute, I'm poor. What in the world do I have a gift to give? You have the gift of faith, the gift of trust. In this world, one of the reasons why I think the American church is so stuck is that we put way too much faith in our own skill sets, our own stuff, our own backgrounds, and we, begin, we get distracted by that. But those of you and history have shown that those who, have, who are poor in this world are rich in faith. They recognize that they need to put their trust in God. And by putting their trust in God, they experience the love of Jesus Christ. They experience God's provision in their lives, the relational provision, their spiritual provision, their emotional provision, and how God goes about and uses, you know, other people and other things in order to provide. There's something within that by which if you are impoverished, you have the gift to be able to tell the world, you don't need a whole that stuff when you have Jesus Christ. And the world and our world needs to hear that that we can find our security and our strength and our, and our fullness in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. In fact, Jesus' bro half-brother James talks about this. And James, he says this in his letter. He says, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? Isn't the kingdom of God inherited to those who put their trust in God? And aren't the people who are impoverished, aren't they the ones who are putting their faith in God why, by which all the wealthy people are not trusting God, they're trusting themselves and they're missing out on the kingdom of heaven? Man, those of you who have their trust in Christ, those of you who are impoverished in this world, you have the opportunity to speak to the world. You can have fullness without the need of having tons of money in your pocket. Was Jesus Christ fulfilled? Was Jesus Christ full? You bet he was. He was full in his relationship with his heavenly father and trusting him in everything that he did. 
So you have the gift to speak to people's lives of a faith and a trust that is so deep and so profound that you have and to give that away. James says it again here in James 1. He says this. He says, believers who are poor have something to boast about, you know, for God has honored them as brothers and sisters, the most, or sons and daughters of the most high God, their royalty. They have something to boast about and, and seeing God move in their lives when they don't have a whole lot of resources. They have something to boast about, to, to say that God is so good that, that he's taken care of me and he's been there for me. And those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a flower in the field. And all he means by that is the, 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 the wealthy in Christ, they should boast that they are humbled. And what does that mean? It's this, that if you're a wealthy, the best thing you can ever learn is the same thing. Your net worth has absolutely nothing to do with your self-worth. Because if it is, your life is going to become completely and utterly worthless the moment you die. Because in the moment that you die, you have nothing with you. And if that's the case, then you become nothing. But in Christ, we find that through faith in him, we have everything that we need. In our relationship with him, in the, the rich faith that he gives us, and the inheritance that we get to have for all eternity. It's not based on our income. It's not based on any of that, but it's based on God's love for all of us. And so what we're going to do is we're going to sing this song. It's called Jaira. And Jaira basically means, you know, um, provider. God is our provider. But my hope is, is as, as you kind of listen to this song and you worship to this song, that you will recognize that and realize that the greatest provision that all of us need is really to be loved and that we are loved by God. That the greatest provision that we really need is really God himself. That he's everything that we've ever needed. No matter what our background is, no matter how much money or lack of money we have in our pockets, all of us are united together in the same need to be loved by God. And the beauty of it is, is we have it. He loves us. He loves us deeply and profoundly. And so would you pray with me? And, and as I finish praying and we worship, that we just remind ourselves, man, God, you're everything that we need. So Heavenly Father, this is my prayer, is that you would just help reorient our hearts and our minds to what's really, truly valuable. It's not the stuff that we have, it's you. You are everything that we've ever needed. We look for it in other stuff. We think we can get it and, and all that it really ends us with is we just need more. I just gotta have more. I just need more. I just need to have this and you just need to have that. It creates all this toxicity of pride. Look at me, I'm better than other people because I have more and it creates shame. Look at me, my life is a failure because I don't have any of that. God, all of that is just junk. I pray that you would just wash our hearts clean, wash our, our minds clean to be able to see who we truly are in your son, Jesus Christ. And through that cleansing, that you would help us to see each other truly the way that we need to see each other as valuable brothers and sisters of the most high God, that we're all royalty together. Thank you, God, for providing that insight, and providing that truth. It's in your son's name I pray, amen.